now as the lights go down at the Velasco Theater. Why shouldn't anyone study popular culture? It might seem light and trivial, but in fact, pop culture is important because often in modern societies, it's what makes us feel that we belong to a common world. So even if we don't all like American Idol or college football or Fox News, people in different regions and from different backgrounds can recognize these as part of our shared life. So pop culture is a kind of social glue. These common reference points can be really powerful and they can shape us in ways we don't even realize. One example is the representation of professors in popular culture. Now, lots of professor characters in movies and on TV come across as arrogant, unfeeling, sometimes as absent-minded, and some of them are dedicated teachers. Together, these images influence our ideas about higher education even when we're not conscious that they're working on us. Looking at some patterns in pop culture can give us some insight into the assumptions, the fears, the contradictory values that shape our society's approach to higher education. Part of what makes pop culture powerful is that it reinforces certain images over and over again. Just think for a second how many times in your life you've come across the image of the absent-minded professor. Was it just once? Was it 10 times? Was it more than 10 times? Probably not every month or maybe not even once a year, but more times probably than you can count. The number of times is important because it's repetition that makes a culture what it is. For example, in the U.S., we believe that you should pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We believe that you eat hot dogs at baseball games. And we believe it's polite to tell people to have a nice day. Why do we believe these things? They're certainly not common to all cultures. Attila the Hun didn't believe in democracy, and Chairman Mao would never have ordered a hot dog at an athletic event. But we in the U.S. are comfortable with these ideas and habits because we hear them and we see them over and over again. You could eat cucumber sandwiches at baseball games, but that doesn't fit the repetitive pattern we're familiar with. It's not what our culture expects or predicts. So repetition is what makes images and values seem so familiar that they start to feel natural, like common sense. And then they're really hard to change. So where do these repetitions come from? Mostly they come from what we see and hear and read. We're constantly being bombarded with representations, pictures and stories that show us our world as we open a magazine or a newspaper, we flip on the TV, we surf the web, or we read a novel. Of course, some ideas about the world also come directly from our own experience. But even when we put our emphasis on direct personal experience, we say, no, really, it's not just in the movies. I know lots of actual absent-minded professors personally. There's also a kind of chicken and egg problem. So some people choose to become professors because they fit the stereotype. Maybe you're the kind of person who wants to inspire students, or maybe you're too bookish to feel like you could ever be an entrepreneur. So those of us who study literature and culture argue that these images actually come before our personal experience and help to shape us, rather than just reflecting our world. And that means that in order to understand ourselves, we need to study the repetitions of pop culture. Images that get repeated so often that they seem like second nature are what we call stereotypes. And there's some pretty entrenched stereotypes of professors active in our culture. We can learn a lot about attitudes towards higher education by focusing on four of them. The first is the inspiring, passionate teacher. The second is the mad scientist. The third is the tedious, dry, pompous pedant. And the fourth is the absent-minded professor, out of touch with the real world. There are certainly others, like the lecherous, predatory professor or the ambitious, career-minded one, but the four I want to discuss have especially deep roots and a lot of power in our social world. All stereotypes come from somewhere, and our story starts with the first really famous teacher in the West, Socrates, back in Athens in the 5th century BC. Socrates' contemporaries thought he was extremely strange. He grew his hair long, like someone from Sparta, even though Athens was at war with Sparta at the time, and he wandered around the city barefoot and dirty. He deliberately stayed poor his whole life, and he never took any money for teaching. Actually, he didn't even have formal students. You'd find him all over town in public places, talking to just about anyone. Slave, free, young, old. Most other teachers at the time forced their students to spit out memorized formulas of conventional wisdom. Socrates, instead, would try to persuade people to join with him in a question and answer process. 
pushing them to recognize contradictions in their own thinking and come to new conclusions about important things like government, truth, and love. The unexamined life is not worth living, he's famous for saying. Socrates' new approach to teaching was really threatening. Calling conventional wisdom into question made some of the most respected and powerful citizens in Athens look like fools. Socrates started to be called a danger to Athenian democracy. He was corrupting young people with his crazy methods, and he was mocking and rejecting the gods. So three citizens pressed criminal charges, and Socrates was sentenced to death. Even this brief story of Socrates' life points to three major ideas which we still associate with teachers today. First, and probably most important, is the teaching method that's named after Socrates, the Socratic method. This is that questioning, probing process that doesn't take anything on faith or authority. Students are supposed to think through their own assumptions, they're supposed to cast a critical eye on received wisdom, and recognize new truths or new ideas through active reasoning. Now, Socrates was deliberately rejecting a model of teaching that's also still with us, that is, teachers transmitting information to students who are expected to absorb and even memorize it. In our modern universities, we tend to embrace both these models. On the one hand, we have lectures which transmit information, and on the other hand, we have small group discussions or seminars which work or are supposed to work like Socratic conversations. The Socratic method is a standard teaching technique in law schools, but notice how pompous and authoritative it looks in this scene from the 1973 movie The Paper Chase, where the law professor is played by John Hausman. I don't think this is exactly what Socrates intended. We use the Socratic method here. I call on you, ask you a question, and you answer it. Why don't I just give you a lecture? Because through my questions, you learn to teach yourselves. Through this method of questioning, answering, questioning, answering, we seek to develop in you the ability to analyze that vast complex of facts that constitute the relationships of members within a given society. Questioning and answering. At times, you may feel that you have found the correct answer. I assure you that this is a total delusion on your part. You will never find the correct, absolute, and final answer. In my classroom, there is always another question, another question to follow your answer. Yes, you're on a treadmill. My little questions spin the tumblers of your mind. You're on an operating table. My little questions are the fingers probing your brain. We do brain surgery here. You teach yourselves the law, but I train your mind. You come in here with a skull full of mush, and you leave thinking like a lawyer. It's interesting that you almost never see an example of a genuine Socratic method in the movies or on TV, a real back and forth between teachers and students. Partly this is because lectures are inherently more theatrical, so they lend themselves to TV and the movies. But it's also because the seminar violates some other powerful stereotypes we have of professors as cold and pompous authorities. So the Socratic method is still with us, whether or not exactly in Socratic form. The second quality associated with Socrates that's still with us is his embrace of poverty. Of course, teachers today don't all really want to be dirt poor, but some of our debates about teacher salaries stem from this Socratic idea that you're not really a genuine teacher if you're doing it for the money. Our culture repeats the idea that good teachers passionately prize truth and goodness and the well-being of their students over greed or self-interest. One example is the movie Freedom Writers, which is about a middle-class woman who starts teaching in a poor, gang-ridden Southern California school. Hilary Swank plays a teacher so dedicated that she takes a second and later a third job so that she can pay for her students' books. She ends up risking her marriage in the process. You're going to sell bras at a department store? Just part-time. I'm having a little trouble getting books and things for the kids, so a little extra money will give me a little more freedom to do what I want. And this way you can play tennis with Evan after work. Okay, let me get my head around this. You're going to get an extra job to pay for your job. It's just temporary, I promise. Once the kids' grades go up, I'll get a little more help from the school, and I get an employee's discount. Isn't that great? Want a new TV? Yeah. 
So the Socratic method has lasted a couple of thousand years, and so has the powerful image of self-sacrificing teachers. The third Socratic value that's really endured is the idea that education shouldn't serve those in power. Socrates embodied the idea that the pursuit of knowledge should be free and independent of powerful interests, even if along the way it turns out to be unpopular or threatening. Gandhi and Martin Luther King both embraced Socrates as a model of civil disobedience, the triumph of conscience over unjust government. And academic freedom remains a crucial value in universities today that we can trace back to Socrates. At the University of Wisconsin, we pride ourselves on academic freedom, as a famous plaque on our administration building reads. Whatever may be the limitations which trammel inquiry elsewhere, we believe that the great State University of Wisconsin should ever encourage that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. In the early 19th century, some thinkers started to suggest that Socrates' pursuit of pure knowledge for its own sake might end up being dangerous in a whole new way. Goethe's Faust wants knowledge so badly that he willingly sells his soul to the devil for it. And Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is so intent on discovering the secret of life that he creates a monster capable of wreaking destruction on humankind. In other words, it's around 200 years ago that we get the first images of the mad scientist. Like Socrates, dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, but now so carried away by it that he doesn't pay attention to consequences. So, in the 19th century, the image of the passionate professor, which is launched by Socrates, kind of splits into two. On the one side, we get the dedicated teacher, committed to freeing students from conventional wisdom. And on the other side, we have the mad scientist, drunk with power, so passionate about the pursuit of truth that he loses track of human costs. The dedicated teacher and the mad scientist both pursue knowledge for its own sake, and they throw their whole feeling selves into the process. But what if the knowledge you're pursuing is dry as dust, stale and useless? In the 19th century, another stereotype starts to take root. George Eliot's novel Middlemarch features a famous scholar character, Edward Kasabin, who's unbearably tedious and pedantic. He's so stuffy that his marriage proposal sounds like this. I am not, I trust, mistaken in the recognition of some deeper correspondence than that of date, in the fact that a consciousness of need in my own life had arisen contemporaneously with the possibility of my becoming acquainted with you. For, in the first hour of meeting you, I had an impression of your eminent and perhaps exclusive fitness to supply that need, connected, I may say, with such activity of the affections as even the preoccupations of a work too special to be abdicated could not uninterruptedly dissimulate. That's academic writing at its worst, and that's in a love letter. So now what emerges is a new idea about professors. The fear that the pursuit of knowledge can come at the expense of feeling. Eliot's Kasabin has had a lot of followers in pop culture ever since. In fact, one of the most common images of professors in our culture is the tedious scholar, stuck in his ivory tower where he pursues arcane knowledge that no one else could possibly care about. Oh yeah, he's too boring to be gay. <laughs> oh, is it, is it 5.15? Is my watch correct? Yes, it is. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I am releasing you a half hour early today. I have uh, uh, an appointment. Putting all these figures together, Socrates, Frankenstein, and Kasabin, you get three of the four stereotypes of the professor we saw at the very beginning. Socrates is the inspiring, radical, firebrand teacher. Frankenstein's passionate too, but he goes too far in the pursuit of knowledge and becomes the mad scientist. And then Kasabin forgets human life in another way. He becomes the cold, pompous, tedious scholar, too focused on tiny, boring details to make human connections. From these, we can trace a lot of our own images of professors that are still very much at work in the world today. For example, you could take the professor from Gilligan's Island. You never hear his name or what he's a professor of. He just seems to know everything about everything. And Gilligan's Island might seem totally removed from Socrates and George Eliot, but you re might remember that like Kasabin, the professor is the most detached and unemotional of all the characters. And like Socrates, the one thing he doesn't know anything about is the pursuit of money. And the millionaire Thurston Howell makes a lot of fun of him for this. 
So we can trace stereotypes even to Gilligan's Island back through history as one more in a long line. The passionate teacher, the mad scientist, and the pedant appear all over the place in popular culture, but together they also generate a new and really powerful stereotype in the 20th century, and that's the absent-minded professor. For example, in this 1952 movie, Monkey Business, Cary Grant plays a chemist who's so interested in pure knowledge for its own sake that he misses something quite literally under his Good morning, nose. Dr. Good morning. Aren't you here early? Oh, yes. Mr. Oxley's been complaining about my punctuation, so I'm careful to get here before nine. Mr. Oxley's on the telephone. Won't you sit down? Uh, huh. I'm glad we have a moment. I have something I want to show you. For instance? Isn't it wonderful? I beg your pardon? The new non plastic stockings you invented. Oh, the M41 acetate project. This is an experimental pair. The first pair out of the factory. Aren't you proud? Turned out rather well. I'll say you can't tear them or snag them or anything. Oh, I'm familiar with the no project. No matter how hard you try. You'd be amazed, Doctor. Oh, no, I wouldn't be amazed. I've done a lot of experimenting with this kind of thing. Of course, I'm through with all of that now. Oh, uh, Mr. Oxley, Dr. Fulton's here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You can come in now. Thank you. If you're not too busy. Well, Miss Laura was just showing me her acetates. Yes, sir. No calls, please. Yes, sir. This fourth stereotype mixes the others together. So like Socrates, Frankenstein, and Kasabin, the absent-minded professor is passionate about knowledge rather than about human connections. Like Socrates, he's not interested in money. And like Kasabin, he doesn't seem to notice human feelings. But there's an important difference here from the earlier stereotype. He's not dangerous like Frankenstein or pompous like Kasabin. He's just got his head in the clouds. So maybe we feel a little sorry for him and find him funny and sweet, but not powerful or scary. Now these stereotypes, the passionate teacher, the mad scientist, the pedant, and the absent-minded professor, might all seem silly 